Hi, everyone. Uh, I want to start with a few words about myself. Uh, I'm a lead programmer at Lively, uh, where we work on games for clients, doing games with well-known IP. So we get a chance to, you know, for the team to interact with cool IP, you know, like American Dad, Family Guy, things like that. Uh, before that, uh, I worked at Playdio uh, doing uh, games that mixed full motion video uh, with 3D graphics. So you sort of had, uh, you know, this uh, avocado character there interacting with actual live uh, video uh, characters. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, before that, uh, I did a couple of years as an indie developer, as you do. And so uh, this is uh, Gun Katana. It's a local multiplayer homage slash, you know, imi poor imitation of Hotline Miami. And, you know, again, a lot of fun doing it. It didn't really come out, but, you know, there's a demo. Uh, on my free time, uh, I really like to write fiction, nonfiction. I wrote and self-published a book about The Matrix that if you like The Matrix movies, feel free to check out. So. Sustainable coding, what does that mean, I hear you ask? Well, with that, I sort of think uh, we just need more the thinking about mental health in the sort of programming field. Uh, we're used to sort of thinking about programmers as a sort of, you know, unattainable people, geniuses, or, you know, someone in the basement doing, you know, the grunt work. And I really want to bring uh, the idea that, no, we are full-fledged people, and also we want to treat everyone else as full-fledged people. Uh, and yeah, just sort of inject good software engineering practices with like, oh, actually those things actually benefit us in a mentally healthy way. Um, so the goals for sustainable coding uh, that I've sort of set out uh, for this talk and for the idea, first of all, uh, to reduce burnout. Uh, so uh, when I was working on Gun Katana, the period between 2014 to 2016. The whole thing culminated in a Kickstarter, and the Kickstarter didn't go very well. Uh, two weeks in, you know, I was just under so much pressure. Uh, it, was, it was painful because the rest of the team were like really pulling for me and saying, no, you got this, uh, you know, keep coding, let's keep having uh, ideas and updates. Uh, but I just really couldn't hack it. Uh, and basically, you know, after two weeks, I just sort of gave up, it, it resulted in me just basically looking at the code editor and feeling like I couldn't even solve a simple uh, conditional statement. That was the amount of like burnout that I was feeling. And I sort of put the game away. Uh, now, one of the consequences of burnout is also that developers uh, you know, tend to leave the industry for other pastures, for things that are more profitable, or you know, sometimes they even leave the whole programming field itself. You know, I hear a lot of uh, programmers just coming up to me and saying, you know, I'd rather be farming than, than having to deal with all of these complex problems. Um, the second goal is teamwork. Just sort of be bringing an awareness that we are working in teams, we are making games in teams. Uh, you know, there's, it's not one person that's sort of going to do everything. Even, you know, you look at amazing indie developers that sort of have done everything. You look on their special thanks page, there's going to be a lot of people in there that sort of helps them, uh, you know, that they've contracted. And yeah, it's just you know, having that sort of awareness. And the third one is being ready for change. Game development is all about prototyping, iterating, finding the fun. And uh, finding the fun aspect has the nasty consequence for programmers to, oh, that cool feature you were doing? Get rid of it. Now we're doing a new thing. Uh, and so you have to sort of uh, be prepared for that change. If you have a solid foundation of your code, it means that, yeah, you can change. Some code is going to be deleted and go away, but a lot of it is going to stay and be like that solid like foundation that you can build from. I want to do a quick aside precisely about fun. Uh, it's going to be a brief, uh, not sustainably coding related, but we'll get there. Uh, I saw a talk uh, in 2013 by Ian Bogost, who is a video game designer, critic, author, and he was explaining to him what fun was. And I really liked this explanation. Um, like it sort of starts off with this idea of playful objects, uh, you know, like the football, you kick it at the wall, it comes back, 
sort of enjoying yourself. You didn't really achieve anything, but you know, it was like a nice, playful experience. Now, gather a ton of those objects together into complex systems with rules and constraints, and that's the key word there. Uh, something like Pandemic, which is this cooperative board game about stopping evil virus from eating the earth. Uh, sure, you could start off the game and you have like the pieces uh, among the various cities and you start working cooperatively with your team and you could go, you know what, I'm just going to swipe away all the virus. You get up and you tell the rest of the team, we just won. And they're going to be looking at you thinking, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> you're not fulfilling the constraints and the challenge of the game that the game designers wanted you to get. And so the fun is in precisely sort of fulfilling those things. And Skyrim is there just because it's an amazing game and it's full of all of these different systems. So it was this quote uh, that Ian said, uh, you know, this feeling of deliberately operating a system that's got rules and constraints, describing fun and games. And it sort of lit up a light bulb in my head where I realized that it wasn't just games, it was game development itself. It's precisely programming, you know, that I sort of feel more uh, in attuned to, that is a very fun and enjoyable experience. Think about the constraints that you have in terms of, yeah, we have to deliver this game by X deadline into X platform with X amount of people and we sort of make decisions that sort of pull the levers to try and get there into a nice, efficient, performant way. Now, the problem with that uh, is that because it's fun, it's something that leads to passion. You're sort of enjoying it so much that, you know, the problem with passion is that it can be exploited. It can be abused because you've given so much of yourself to it. You want to, you, you take the problems home with you. And, that's where sustainable coding comes. It's about, okay, being aware that, yes, it's fun. Yes, it's something that we're very passionate about and we love doing, but we're just gonna pace ourselves so that we can work in the long run and be programming into our retirement age in games rather than farming somewhere. Um, now there's good signs you know, from the industry. You have uh, remote working, you've got flexible hours. You've got four-day work weeks, you know, with some studios like Splash Damage just announced that they're going uh, four-day work week, which is great. Uh, but I think that's not enough, especially like related to the programming field. Uh, you know, I feel like we don't have a strong voice saying we want to slow down and we want to take our time and you know pace ourselves. And really, this talk is sort of like my manifesto against the idea of you know the programmer in the basement that hates everyone, you know and sort of speaks in grunts, you know, we gotta abolish that, you know, we can, we can be so much better than that. So I came up with this sort of sustainable coding principles, uh, five ideas that I've sort of learned over uh, the course of my career. Um, and, oh, I just did a little sip. And to start off, uh, the first principle is maybe something you might not be expecting. Uh, it's nothing to do with programming necessarily. Uh, but yeah, it's kindness. It's a word that is sort of rarely heard in the programming team chats and environments, uh, but it's something that we desperately need. Um, kindness is about sort of bridging the gap between you know what you're doing and what the next person is doing and what you're sort of all working together to achieve. It's being able to sort of lower your guard and be vulnerable and say, yes, I need help. Do you need help? Uh, and sort of like not letting the fear get to you. So feedback is a big topic within kindness. Uh, you know, programmers, we do code reviews. We look at each other's things and features and we say, you know, that's going okay or that's bad. Uh, Want to share a story on feedback uh, early on my career. Uh, you know, this is like maybe 13 years ago. Uh, I submitted a code review to a website, you know, that uh, people can sort of add comments and say, you did this, you did, you did that. And one person added 50 comments and I had only submitted like three files and there was barely any you know, substantial changes. I felt attacked. 
<laughs> I felt like, okay, this person has something against me for some reason. Yeah, some of the comments were fair. The data structures that I was using were not great. Maybe the my logic wasn't, you know, fantastic. But a lot of them were things like, oh, I don't like this. No reason given. This is wrong, but I'm not going to tell you why. Oh, here's a misspelling. After 49 other comments, I don't think I need to know about a misspelling. <laughs> I'm already uh, upset enough. So yeah, there's, what that taught me is that there's different ways uh, to give feedback. You can suggest things. You can say, here's another way that you could have done that. Or have you thought about implementing this in this other way using this framework? Don't assume ignorance just because the person didn't use it. Maybe they didn't have a chance to. Maybe they, they were in a hurry. Empathy, that's another big word. It's having that emotional intelligence to recognize that someone is maybe having a bad day. Uh, in, in programming, often you're sort of like, oh, here's a bug, go and fix it. Here's this feature, go and do it. And like, do you realize that maybe that person needs more time, needs to sort of take a break? Maybe they've just fixed a ton of hard things and you, you, you could just pace them a bit better. I've got a quick story about empathy as well. Uh, this was like three months into my just overall programming career. So this was like maybe 14 years ago. So like the, the year before maybe or two years. And yeah, I'm having another code review. This time is at the screen. Uh, my lead programmer is right next there. Uh, we're sort of sitting at his desk. And um, he's very intent focused on the code. And there's some commotion outside the office. And he goes, what is that? And I'm like, okay, you know, we, we haven't really spoken outside of work before. It was all always like sort of focused on work. And so I go, oh, that's some, uh, like a protest that's going on outside. There's people with picket signs and things. And he goes, no, what is this? And he's pointing at the screen <laughs> at a bug, some horrible bit of code that I had written uh, on some web development language that I can't remember. But I'll tell you what I remember. I'll never forget the way that he responded to me there. He didn't interact with me on the same way that I was sort of trying to bring. I wanted to build that rapport with him. And he sort of shut me down and just kept going about work. I don't know I can explain empathy better than that. You know, don't do that. <laughs> it's a perfect opposite. Failure. Uh, kindness is also about failure, about recognizing that we're going to fail, that we're failing all the time. Uh, if you approach like your programming team and your game development team and you're saying we do all the right things we know all the best options and you sort of uh, badmouth other studios or other projects because they're not using the best tools and the best things and then your project fails and something goes wrong and there's a horrible bug your team is not going to feel psychologically safe uh, to sort of say, hey, we, we need to fix this, we need help. They'll sort of grow inward and you know, be even afraid to say, hey, there's a bug here. You need to sort of like, you know, just be upfront about failure and, and particularly with junior developers. You know, they sort of mimic and learn from seniors and leads and the rest of the team that's been doing it for longer. And if they see everyone sort of afraid, they're gonna go and mimic. Hey, let's talk about some code. This is a coding talk. Clean code is not a new idea. Uh, Uncle Bob is the creator of the idea for it. He wrote a book about it. Um, he's got many, many, many years of experience. Funny thing about clean code, uh, there was this Far Cry source code leak last week, and I saw a couple of tweets about it. And one was like, hey, there's a 7,000 line, lines of code file here. And the game still made loads of money. We don't need clean code. And there was someone else, you know, replying, saying, exactly. And I could only think, oh my God, this is totally antithetical. You know, it's not what I mean when I'm talking about clean code. It's definitely not about having nice, pretty code to show off to the player. Obviously, they don't care, they're never gonna see it. But you're working on a team who they need to understand and to be able to read while you're writing. And code you know, can be 
easy to read. You just have to put the, in the work, make things explicit. Um, an example there is you know, just a very simple example. The first line, we can understand what's happening. The main character is jumping. It's got some parameters that are readable. And the second one is just some letters with jump in the middle. So extrapolate that into your 7,000 lines of code file and see if you can understand it. Uh, this next point on clean code is just, uh, I find it very useful uh, to bring in juniors into new projects. Just have an entry point where you can point. This is where the project sort of starts, where all of the dependencies are initia initialized. Um, and then they, because they know that they've got that starting point, when they have a new feature that they got to work on, they can sort of like grow from that place and sort of find their way about among the code that is written in a nice, well-written way, and so they will know where things are. And this is like the classic of clean code, writing things in small blocks with hatch, which have one task. It's basically the single responsibility principle, who is part of the solid principles, who were also made by Uncle Bob, he's got years of experience. Um, you know, and Unity itself, you know, I, I use Unity all the time. Unity itself supports this with the idea of the entity component system. You've got your mono behaviors that you can sort of add to game objects. And you can easily imagine small bits of code uh, that have those um, properties. Why do we want them to be small and with a single responsibility? When you're looking at the code and you're sort of changing context all the time, when you change to just a small bit, you know exactly what that does. If you got a huge file, you're going to lose yourself in it. You're not going to know what it does next time you look at it. So group your small blocks of code into individual modules, sort of gathered around the logical feature that they're doing. In a similar way, this is like the small blocks of code. Uh, it's easy to sort of understand that all of the quest code is in this area and all of the Taming animals code, you see this other area. It also makes it easier to sort of remove something if a feature goes wrong and you don't actually need it. And the benefit of that uh, is that you don't have to worry about how to detangle them. An explicit uh, a visualization of that is when you have uh, your systems, then uh, your modules uh, actually knowing too much about each other. Now think of, you, you did a quest, you, know, you implemented the quest and the game designer wanted the quest that needed you to tame an animal, talk to a character and to check the inventory. And you sort of, you know, the team ended up putting all of the code in the quests code. And now you've got to do, you know, it's been six months, you got to add something new to quests. So you look at the code for it and it's got all these references to all of these other things. That means that you're gonna have to recreate the mental models of those classes and of that code in your head next time that you look at the quest code. If you think about the way they communicate and you make it in a way that avoids the highly coupled communication between them and just sort of really isolates them, you can sort of just really focus on each one and your brain doesn't have to suffer as much. You don't have to overload it with more than four to seven thoughts, which is, you know, according to studies, and that I feel myself, uh, sort of a limit uh, that you can think of. So you're sort of gaining a benefit because you've organized things well. The third uh, principle, sustainable coding principle, is flexibility. This is the embodiment of the ready for change goal. It's being ready for that change that's gonna come. Uh, an example that happened uh, while I was doing a mobile game, uh, we had to implement a shop. Uh, it was for iOS only at the time. So we had like a good objective C knowledge in the team. We went at it, we developed our own purchasing library and we directly had our code references. And then a month passes and we need to do the same for Android. And all of our code is referencing the iOS code. And it means that it was really hard to sort of detangle this and to make it work for Android as well. 
But luckily, we looked at solid, and the last letter of solid is dependency inversion. This tells us have your classes depend on abstract things rather than concrete. Uh, and the way that this helps you uh, is that what we did was we shifted from having this sort of de direct dependency on iOS to have a sort of generic purchasing interface that then um, the game could sort of like compile for different devices and it will have the Android library, the iOS library. And that means that while you're programming, you don't have to worry about that necessarily, that bit of code. Again, separating things, reducing the cognitive load, and you know, making your life easier. After dependency inversion, it's frequent to talk about dependency injection. This is a design pattern uh, that tells us about how you can organize things in a nice, clean, readable manner. Uh, there's a really good framework for Unity called UniDI. Uh, so the classical way of thinking about dependencies and like think of dependencies as the various bits of code that you have, like the different modules that we spoke about, and how you're going to say to other classes within your code that they need to reference these other things. And the classical way is you have one sort of god class that knows everything, instantiates everything, and then you have to pass that class around to everyone. You end up with like huge sort of uh, constructors or big methods where you're passing things. It becomes increasingly hard to make sense of what's going on there. And then look at this nice clean code here where we can have uh, different uh, files that are sort of co uh, communicating with the container, which is like this dependency injection container. And we're sort of saying, OK, these are all of our dependencies that we need on this file. And we can even look at the ordering of the dependencies. And you, know, you can sort of initialize them uh, at the moment as well. And an example of how you could use it, uh, we've got a client class here that wants to use the player spawner service, the conversation manager. And you simply inject them. And the framework. In this case, UniDI will just do all of the job of getting that dependency to the place that you need it. The third point, yeah, oh, oh, I've, I've already, yeah, continuing from the flexibility point, uh, this is about the communication between modules. Uh, so classically, you sort of have event-driven programming, which is you create an event. Let's think about player attacked. Uh, other classes will sort of listen to this event and they'll trigger actions when that happens. Maybe you need some UI that's going to happen, or you need um, you know, the health bar to reduce and to prepare to reduce the health of the, of the character, of the player. The funny thing about player attacked, it's not very understandable. It could mean the player has attacked or the player was attacked. And that's precisely the problem with the event-driven idea. You sort of end up with, oh, we need an event that is just before you're attacked or just after. And you end up adding, adding more and more events to this list. And it gets increasingly hard to debug and to make sense of and to sort of detangle the logic of the code. So an alternative to that, so that you don't have to keep track of all of those things, is to just sort of shift the way that you're communicating about things. Something that uh, web development has been doing for a while is reactive programming. This changes the idea from event-driven into data streams that you subscribe to and you listen for the value to change. It means that it's a lot more easier to sort of rationalize about and to know that is attacking, OK? We're telling it that now it's going to be true. And now it's going to be false. And we sort of give the responsibility to the people, to the classes who are listening uh, to that um, data stream to you know, do with that as they may. Now, a quick example on it is we've got like a skill check service. Uh, think of it as a rolling a die. We've got our subject observable. And when we run the method do skill check, it's going to publish a new value to the data stream between 0 and 100. And you know, whoever is listening to that is going to 
get that value. Uh, we've got our taming service to check for taming animals. And I don't know how well you can see, but you've got there the subscription done on the skill check performed. We've got the bit of injection there as well. And it's all like, you know, 10 lines or something. Uh, so you subscribe there. You, it's going to call on taming successful when the event is sort of dispatched here. And then there's a nice thing there where you've got that where, where you're actually filtering the data that comes in. And I, I just really like it in a sort of, I understand what that does, and it's sort of not that many lines of code, and I find that makes it easier to sort of understand what I'm working with. Uh, I don't have to sort of detangle a long list of lines of, of code. The fourth one is configurability. And if you saw the talk yesterday from Ron um, about uh, programming as dusk falls, that talk was all about configurability and tooling. Uh, the idea is that you're going to expose as much as you can of the game to the rest of your team. You're going to bring your team in by adding these sort of configurable sliders and values. The idea is that you sort of stop being the bottleneck. You know, the programmers don't need to implement everything. You know, that's sort of like the, you start off traditionally like that, and then you realize you can create these sort of configurations that are going to uh, empower and sort of multiply the, the, str the strength of the designers. You know, all of the sort of features become not exactly the same feature that they were when you implemented it. Now they can be changed and they can be improved, and you don't have to do anything. It's all thanks to the designers and to the fact that you made it um, configurable. Now, in Unity, this is very easy to do with scriptable objects. Uh, I apply the single responsibility principle to configuration, and I'll tell you why, on one project that I worked on. Yes, we had configuration. It was one spreadsheet, an actual file that was checked into version control, it had maybe 20 different sheets inside, and it had thousands of lines on each sheet. And you needed, oh, we need a new feature that also needs a new column, that also needs maybe 10 different entries on the rows. And it was quite hellish to work with. Uh, you now, the, the good thing is that you can, at least you know, in Unity, split your configuration. This example is um, think of like a devil may cry game. So character action, you've got here like the definition of a step in a sort of string uh, of attacks. Um, it allows the game designer to order them in whichever way they want. And again, you don't have to do anything. The code uh, will look here and like play the right animation. Artists can come in and contribute, which is, the purpose of making things configurable. The last one is tooling, which is uh, sort of like the, the way that you make your configuration applicable for everyone else in your team. And tooling is you creating uh, tools uh, that are going to allow you to, again, multiply uh, what the team can do. Uh, you know, they take a little while to maintain. They cost a bit because, oh, the designer is not using this in the right way. But they're always worth it. And there, there's a bit of a... Uh, I frequently get artists and designers come to me uh, working on the tools that my team has worked on. And they'll be like, oh, I've used this in the wrong way. I've pressed the buttons in the wrong order. I've done something really bad. And I just feel, no, 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 you're fine. The tools are the ones that need to do the work for you. Me and my programmers need to go in and fix the, the problem for you. And that's how we're sort of like, we're iterating on the tools themselves. And because the programming team has sort of opened up to the rest of the uh, disciplines, everyone else sort of feels uh, inclined to contribute and to say what's going on with them, rather than sort of admit or assume that it's their problem when it's not. One word on tooling. Uh, if something takes more than two clicks, automate it. You're saving time. You're saving 
uh, human error that happens because you're sort of moving things manually, you're adding things, you're naming things. And uh, you know, you're gonna make a mistake, you're gonna call it the same thing. So these are opportunities for you to really um, add automation, make those processes simpler, snappier, you depend on them. And so you have more time to worry about the sort of bigger problems that you're working on rather than, oh, this 3D asset didn't import correctly. You can fix it. And the last point on tooling uh, is just use all of the features of your IDE and your tools and what you use uh, to edit code. Be that Rider, which is what I recommend for C Sharp, and I hear that it's also very good for Unreal. I've been using a JetBrains IDE since the beginning of my career uh, in different sort of languages. And it's amazing that it exists for uh, C Sharp now. There was a period there where we had to use MonoDevelop, which was single pane. You couldn't have more than one window open. It was pretty terrible to work with. But yeah, uh, just tell the programmers they work and look at all the tools that you've got. Look at all of these uh, options that the menu for Rider has. And this is just one of the menus. Uh, it's got things to help you refactor, to move code from one side to the other, to extract interfaces from uh, files and classes. And yeah, I just find it immensely useful. And I just, when I see that uh, a junior programmer is sort of like searching things manually and not using shortcuts. I just want to you know, tell them, front load them all of this knowledge. It's like, look, you can make your life easier for you. You don't need to uh, you know, go and manually find things in the hierarchy. So I really believe that uh, teams that have sort of have kindness at the sort of epicenter of their thoughts and they are aware of the impact that programming has on their mental health and on each other, that they are um, conscious that when you're giving work for someone or you're writing code that's sort of written in a hastily manner, it's going to be really hard to understand. It's going to have an impact on them later on. Teams that are sort of aware of that, that are making things configurable, bringing in the rest of the disciplines and being really like, how can we help you? How can we make the game in a nice, quick way? And you know, it's not just quick because you wanna get the money at the end. It's, it's because about, you just want it to work well. You want things to, if they do break, we can solve it as a team. And yeah, I believe teams that embody this uh, can only succeed. And this is what I'm trying to do with my team uh, at Lively, and I'm, I'm really enjoying the experience. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. Thanks for being here. I don't know if anyone's got any questions. Questions? That's fine. <laughs> oh, there's a question. Thank you. Uh, great talk. Um, how do you teach people kindness in a programming team? <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, I think you just gotta approach it as everyone is capable of kindness, uh, even if it, it doesn't seem like at the first time. You know, treat them kindly, and they will hopefully treat you kindly in return. And one thing that I think really needs to be sort of explicit is that you're being kind to yourself. You're saying, I'm gonna stop work today at this time because I need to do this. If you're working uh, you know, with someone else trying to fix a bug and uh, the bug needs to go out really soon, but no one has sort of established, oh, that we're gonna stay into the night. And if you're in a higher, position than the other person that you're working with, or even if you're not, if you say, hey, it's the end of a work day, we're gonna stop now. You're telling them that it's okay to, you know, just stop and not carry on uh, crunching. And I think that's sort of, it's my example. That's how I do it. Thank you. Thanks.
great talk. Thank you so much. Um, so I uh, work in games education uh, at, at a school called Digital Arts and Entertainment. Um, and we are piloting next year uh, a course on on soft skills, career skills in the games industry, which inevitably will include sustainability. Um, and programmers are, are, are a large subset of this uh, student community. It's a game development school primarily. Um, and I'm just wondering, in your opinion, within the games education space, uh, what are like what kinds of things should students who are the future programmers of this industry, what should they know about working sustainably, like within within education? Well, it's it's a tricky one because within education, you're going to have school projects and deadlines that sort of need to be met. And they will do the similar sorts of things that we do poorly in the games industry, and they'll sort of work weekends and way into the night. I think what you can include is just having that sort of baking in the extra time so that they can actually complete these projects and to look at how uh, companies that do it already, how do they do it, you know, where people are not crunching and they're not working over time. Like, how do they manage the projects in a way that the code, yeah, they, they can do the code and they can sort of finish by end of day. And yeah, just exactly the soft skills and sort of integrating them uh, with working in a team and being able to sort of call each other out when someone notices that something is going wrong. I think that's the start. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, great talk again. Um, so as a, a solo developer, I've been trying to do um, uh, adhere to like solid principles. Um, I'm a software engineer by trade. Um, and that has helped a lot in terms of revisiting old code. Um, I just wonder in in terms of like kindness for a, for a, someone working on their own, is that, have you got any tips for how to like treat yourself better <laughs> rather than just thinking about other people? Uh, I think it's it starts with uh, recognizing that you know you have to sort of stop thinking about it at a certain point, make rules for yourself about like when are you going to stop working on it for the day, don't look at it during the weekend. Uh, you know, that's what happened when I was working on, on Katana, where I would like just not stop thinking about it. You know, I would be. Uh, with my partner and just thinking, oh, how, how am I going to solve that bug? You have to, to sort of really be regimented. And I think once you create that habit of like, I'm not looking at this anymore, that's sort of like the biggest way that you're being kind to yourself is by sort of creating that habit of, I've turned off and it's fine. I'm happy with it. I'm not worrying in the back of my head. I'm not feeling anxiety and fear about what's next. But yeah, it's a really difficult thing to do, you know, as an indie developer, you know, you're sort of dependent on the success of it. But if you're able to turn that and only worry about it during the hours, I think that that's the first way to start being kind. Thank you. That's it. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you.